And it's when I opened the Word of God. I prayed and cried out to God, and it stopped. It was right when I went to the Scripture. That made all the sense in the world for me. There's so many angles by which you can prove the Bible is the Word of God. That's one nobody typically thinks about, you know? Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. We are on location in New York, but before I get to that, I want to welcome, obviously, the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Doing great, bro. I'm excited about this show, man, talking about the Word. Amen. Yeah, we're going to be talking about the Word, but I want to give people a little insight. Obviously, what you're looking at right now is far different from our usual shooting that we do back in Simi Valley at Blessed Hope Chapel, but we've done a makeshift studio here at Blessed Hope, New York. And so maybe, Joe, you could talk a little bit about the family that we're with and some of the people and some of the things we're going to be doing over the next few days, because we're going to actually get some of the audience here involved as well in some of the shows that we're going to be doing earlier in the week for them. Yeah, we're with the uh, Von I family and we're in their barn <laughs> where they hold the uh, live stream uh, fellowship time. And it's just uh, it's been such a blessing. You know, it's uh, a lot of joy. We're just uh, having a lot of laughter and stuff showing <laughs> how they start talking about Chad's so-called initiation into my family, you know, uh, uh, before he married uh, Holly. And, and it was quite funny. I'm like, don't show that thing. I felt so bad for Chad, man. It was it was kind of Chad's a, a tough competitor. So. Uh, he had no idea the game against his wife was totally rigged. And I won't go into more detail because somebody maybe will show that to you sometime in some kind of scoop <laughs> thing. I'm like, and I see myself in the background. I go, yeah, that's how I felt back then. Because when, when Chad would finally get a good win in, I'd clap because I'm like, praise God, Chad got something in. Because you poor guy, you're, you're pretty tough though. So I realized, wow, Chad would not quit, man. He's got a good temperament there. He's going to definitely be a good husband. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're, we're cutting up with the Von Ice and stuff and, and, and their extended family and just how they, they love the Lord. They feel the Lord. And it's just so, so like-minded, you know? So, uh, we just having a great time with them. And, uh, they welcomed us with, uh, part of their extended family. Uh, uh, yesterday we had just a great time with them and now we're at their house and we're excited because uh, we, we, you know, it's neat to come to, we have already met them. They came and visited us before. So we're meeting more of their, them and their extended family and the, the extended live stream groups that are, there's a few live stream groups here in New York and we'll all be getting together Saturday for a conference. So we'll be doing a chat. will be opening up. We'll be talking about the canon of scripture, which by the time you get this, that'll probably have had happened, yeah. you know? So, uh, but this is going to be, you know, more personal with you guys. And we're also going to be doing uh, something on, that you guys will get a couple weeks later as we do it with you more personally in this kind of setting on Enneagram, Enneagrams, Enneagrams and a disc and those things that are popularly infiltrating the church, which have demonic origins. They're just taking the churches by storm in the last decade and a half or so. So we'll be getting into that, but we're really excited. We'll also be doing some Marvel stuff that the, we'll kind of the climax of that whole series. will be uh, looking at uh, Marvel in DC and things to be aware of what the writers are writing and how they're manipulating and conditioning the world and much of the church uh, in a very diabolical way that we have incredible proof and evidence from quotations and everything else. We get into that on Saturday night. So we're excited because uh, with uh, Mauricio and and, and Sam's group uh, with the Von Eif group and they've all started together and everybody coming together just to rejoice in Jesus and, and have a great time together. So I'm really, it's just been, uh, it blesses my heart because we hear over and over again just the wonderful things that God is doing. And of course there's always challenges as there w was in the early church and you grow together and so forth with it, our individual lives, with groups, with churches. But it's beautiful to see the hurdles that people get over and the growth that you see and the love for Jesus one another, the other that in sanctification so we just praise, praise the Lord for just all the beautiful things that happen. But it's heartbreaking also because you also see uh, a sense of desperation for truth these days. Because yeah. as we continue, even today, as I was meeting several different, a, a few different people today, because I met several yesterday, uh, the same story. Wow, you know, we praise God for what you guys are doing because it's so hard to get the word. It's hard, so hard to find pastors out here. And, and it's wherever we go, the Bible Belt, over and over again in the Bible Belt, here, up, here in New York, you know. And... I said to him, I said, well, yeah, I'm just the messenger bringing the word. There's so much in the word, I, I still, it's almost incomprehensible unless you understand that this is prophesied, that the enemy is very, very real, that there's a lot of people that want to have their ears tickled. But I said, you know, to me, it would be a lot harder to do what these false teachers are doing 
because I praise God. I just get to go to God, God's word and just share his truth. It's not that difficult. It's not rocket science, you know. You go to his word and I go, man, I think it'd be a lot of work just to do your own thing on a Sunday morning or, or midweek. I, I'd never even be tempted to do that because I fear and love the Lord and want to project his word. But what a whole lot of work people are going through to make a bunch of garbage. And in the midst of it, people are being led astray. And they're not getting God's truth. So I'm excited to segue back to Chad because we're going to be talking about God's truth and his word and how important it is to be in the word of God. Amen. No, amen. And, you know, and one of the things I just want to go through because you guys are watching us uh, film here is I know Joe and I have the same tendency of hitting the desk here, but our cameras are connected. So we'll do our best not to be too shaky on here as best as we can. But hopefully you guys will still be blessed. By it. And if you're listening by podcast, that doesn't matter either way. But, Ch but Chad's got more Italian than me, but we both got to restrain our <laughs> Italianness. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of stick my arms on the table and not let them move too much. But but nonetheless, we, we are excited about what's going on. And one of the things, as Joe had already mentioned, when it comes to getting together with these families, and one of the cool things is meeting so many. We've gone not only to Texas, but now we have a bunch of people in Idaho. We have some people in Florida. We have people really all over. And New York was another one that we wanted to visit. Now we have Costa Rica, Ensenada, Mexico. So we really are getting out there and getting the word out there. And, and praise God, we're able to, because of a lot of the things of teaming up with different families and so forth that just said, hey, I, I love that you guys get in the word and that you dig into the, the word of God because that is the most important thing. And I know Joe and I had talked about this specifically even on the last live show we did before we left, just making sure that everything is grounded in the word of God. And that's been, as for me, being discipled by Joe, coming to, coming to faith after watching They Sold the Social Rock and Roll and then going to the church and being discipled, and realizing the dedication to the Word of God, one of the reasons I wanted to dig into it was, okay, well, why is everything about the Scripture? Why do we always go back to the Scripture? Why isn't it simply, you know, I can get some great philosophical nuggets from this person, or I can get some really good historical documentation from this person, and these are really just ideas. And I, one of the things, even though we talk about it um, here and there in terms of what somebody believes, but I really do think the difference between adhering to the scriptures and trusting what the word of God says is different than what we would call the mere Christianity movement, which is this idea that, well, as long as you believe these core essentials, which you do believe in essential Christianity, but it's almost like the word of God. Yeah, that's cool too. But as long as you believe the resurrection and uh, then you're okay with me. Yeah. I, I, I encountered a gal uh, years ago that was in fellowship and became a member and she was concerned about a couple of her friends that were part of a fellowship and they had reduced the their their statement of faith which i found on the phone call to uh you know if you read online you think oh they're they seem orthodox you know uh but as a, she was concerned because the pastor believed some really strange things and she said could you talk to the pastor and find out what they believe because these are dear friends of mine and i'm really concerned they're in a, a, a bad place you know but she just had more of a gut thing and i was like I knew that he's, it was, you know, the denomination was, had become very liberal. So I was like, yeah, they you know, they probably are, but I'm not, you know. So I, I called him up, I talked to him, and uh, he said, well, you know, we, 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 you know, we had this talk, and he's like, well, I believe, you know, we believe that as long as you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, you can be, you're a member of this fellowship. So they reduced it to Jesus, believing Jesus is Lord, uh, which sounds good that, you know, you have to believe Jesus is Lord. You have to have at least that, right? But, uh, but then when he began to explicate their beliefs, uh, that they believe it's okay to, uh, you know, gay marriage and so forth. And, and I said, well, would you, I pressed him on some of the issues. I go, so would you allow a, uh, and that was just before, that was before gay marriage was, was legal. So I shouldn't, I sh it, it, it was, the conversation was more along, we believe it's okay with having gay couples here and so forth, and that they could be members and so forth. And I said, would you let a gay couple teach one of your classes, or are you doing that? And, and then he kind of got silenced there, and he wouldn't answer the question. And he, then he says, well, probably not. Well, then I'm thinking, well, probably not. Why not? If they're members of the church in good standing, and you can, you, you're affirming a, a homosexual lifestyle, which is so contrary to Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, Jude, you know, uh, so much of the New Testament, and Jesus uh, teaching on marriage, which we're going back to the authority of Christ and, this, and what we're talking about here. And then as we began to talk, I said, what about abortion? How, what's your view on abortion? And his viewpoint was that, uh, he didn't want to say whether he felt it was okay or not, but he said, I'd never tell somebody that not to get an abortion because if they did, they'd feel guilty. 
<laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, what a, you know, what, you know, what a ridiculous position. I don't want to say don't commit murder because this guy's tempted to kill his wife because he might feel guilty afterwards after he does it. It was just, but the point was, I was like, wow, these were, re which it sparked my remembrance of that, Chad, when you said they're reducing, uh, you know, what they call Christianity to, you know, a few doctrines. In this case, it was to one doctrine, which sounds great. But you have to believe that Jesus is Lord, but that was it. As long as you can say Jesus is Lord, you, you know, you can basically believe anything. And that's where we're at in a lot of the church today. Yeah, and... And, and by the way, Jesus no, is yeah. not Lord. Jesus is not Lord, even though you're saying he's Lord, if you're not obeying <laughs> you him in all these other areas. Yeah, no, uh, 100%. And, and we'll talk about that specifically when we talk about what we're going to be talking about in terms of the Word of God is what was Jesus' view on the authority of Scripture? Amen. What was Jesus' view on that? Because if you're saying Jesus is Lord, but then it's merely lip service when you do not esteem the Word of God in the same way that Jesus does. And what I want to talk about a little bit, and this I think it will make for more of an open discussion with Joe, because he knows a lot of the Scriptures, obviously, that are on my heart in terms of this topic that I want to discuss. And this will be totally different than the presentation I'll give to the guys. But the fact is, is you may hear things, and these are popular statements that you may hear, uh, maybe even at Bible studies. And you may hear them, and you might be surprised about some of the people I bring up, because when we talk about even the doctrine of sola scriptura, a lot of people will attach that to Luther. But when you find out his view on canon, which we'll talk about in this show, mm. you might go, whoa, that's a little strange. Uh, and, and I want you to hear that. But this is something, and, and like I said, it'll be more, a little more open. And, and we're, we, it's cool because we can ad-lib this episode a little bit for you. We're doing a bunch of teachings, and it's like, well, we get to talk about the Word of God. What else is there to talk about? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember this happened with Beth Moore, but it's something I see all the time. And you may hear the term red-letter Christians and so forth. But people will say, you shouldn't be taking the Word of Paul in the same level of the word of Jesus, you know, in the gospels and so forth, where you have Jesus in these red letters, as if these are the words of Jesus and Paul, and it's just slightly ordained by God. And, and that, I mean, just from a, a purely surface standard, uh, if we were talking about who actually wrote it outside of, as we're certainly going to get into second Peter uh, chapter one, concerning who actually wrote those words, but just as a purely, uh, you know, looking at it as the actual man that God used to write it, we're talking about looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writing down what Jesus said. Yeah. And I think this gives us a good epistemology. So a source for our knowledge, a source for where we come back to, because I think that statement alone, Joe, is one that automatically assumes something. Yeah. Um, that is wrong. So this is one of the things we talk about is make sure we have right thinking about the Word of God. I believe this is part of rightly dividing the Word of Truth because you have to have right thinking and understanding where you go back to for your knowledge because if I thought that, well, you know what, I should put more, more weight here uh, outside of the words of Paul, but then I'm remembering, well, who wrote down those words of Jesus? And if I was doing it just from a fleshly uh, you know, merely non, you know, biblical authority movement, those would actually be the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's a great point, especially when you have Paul himself talking about letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's times where he refers to Christ's teachings in First Thessalonians 4. He talks about uh, the Lord's teaching on his, his return. Uh, in Timothy, Paul talks about, uh, you know, not muzzling the ox and the, a worker's worthy of his wages. Quote, and he calls it scripture, right? Which, so he's quoting Jesus himself, not just the apostles with the gospel accounts, the synoptics in the gospel of John, but Jesus is quoting the word of God. Or I should say Paul is quoting Jesus at times, or I should say referring to Jesus, definitely quoting him when he talks about the uh, workers worthy of his wages. Uh, but then when you look at Paul's own writings, he talks about things, the words, what I'm communicating to you, the commandments I'm giving you are from the Lord, you know? And then in 1 Corinthians 14, toward the end of that chapter, that bro, he goes, you know, he gives them, you know, delineates on, how they're misusing the gifts and how they're used properly. And he gives them a structure and he's not referring to any of Jesus' words at this point. And he says, he basically tells them that what I'm giving to you is from the Lord. And if you ignore what I'm giving to you, the Lord will ignore you. 
And I love that because it's so powerful regarding, man, you better be circumspect regarding what he says about the gifts of the Spirit. Not to forbid them, but also not to misuse them. And if you do, kind of do your own thing, which so many of those in the, for instance, the Ready Movement, you know, Bethel and so forth, they, they go, they depart from Scripture, and they act like they're really getting close to the Lord and the Holy Spirit. When it says, if you ignore these teachings by Paul, you'll be ignored by him. So uh, what's interesting to me is I'm, I'm fascinated by what, for years, I was a newer Christian when I saw, I really honed in on what Paul said there because I was like, man, there's people in trouble on both sides with regard to the gifts. But he's basically letting us know not only the words he's writing to us are from the Lord, and, he, and that's more than once in Corinthians. He also is letting us know there that the Lord is going to judge you on the basis one way or another as to how you respond to his teaching through Paul. So that's heavy because the Lord is actually saying, yeah, Paul, and the Lord Jesus said, you know, the Holy Spirit would lead you into all truth. And there's different applications, of course, of, of how that, 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 but we understand that from the apostolic viewpoint, the biblical viewpoint, is that he'd be bringing them remembrance what he, what he said to them, that they would write down uh, what he said to them, so it would be accurate. And by the way, uh, a commentary, I think, I have a, a really neat commentary on the uh, Gospel of, of, of John by Keener, and he makes a really neat point. I was looking at it a few weeks ago. I thought, oh, it's, that, it, it just it goes some into some of the background of the Jews at that time, and how we underestimate how much how much uh, the you know the rabbi's words were memorized and the scripture was memorized by uh, students of rabbis. But he's talking, but he's talking in this context of those who are following Jesus. They believe he's a Messiah that they probably had memorized so many of the things they'd said before they ever even committed them to print, and they valued his words in such a way. But then you have these same apostles, which I know we're going to get to Chad a little bit later, so I don't want to really get into it now until you're ready to get into that. Because I said, hey, <laughs> what do you want? What are we going to talk about here? And he says, I'm just going to bring up a bunch of scriptures that are just beautiful regarding. Uh, you know, the canon of scripture. And I said, oh, let's go for it. But it's just so amazing when you realize that you're, praise God, we can go anywhere in the New Testament and read contextually what the Lord has said or what the apostles are saying and understand that we are reading the word of God. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that. And it, it's really, it's really cool. Some of the texts that you brought up right there. And specifically when we talk about the apostles as well, because the apostles, when they would come to a place and remember it was Jesus himself. We have Matthew, you know, 16 as well. Um, Jesus is the one who commissioned the apostles to be the sent out ones and that these guys that, that God used in a mighty powerful way these these apostles that he really did give the keys to the kingdom and he did use them to build the church amen and he used them to build the church and they were God's mouthpieces here on earth when he when they would speak they said we as he told the Thessalonians what did he tell them he told them that when you came when I came to speak to you you heard me and the apostles for what it was not the words of man but the words of God himself and so that was expected when they came and when we think about the word of God and we'll go back to this a little bit um, when it comes to, we talk about canon, that's just a standard or a rule of measurement, I think is the best way. Yeah. This is the rule and measurement by which we judge all things. And we talked about the apostles and the authority that God gave them in order to write the scriptures, right? And in order to speak the truth. But you even think about this, and this is really, really important when we talk about canon, because I, I don't want to get into a big historical discussion about that. I think that maybe we could do that on another time because there are some really good, yeah. uh, I mean, we could talk about the moratorium fragment. We could talk about what the early church believed, some of the things that were right, some of the things that were wrong. But one of the things in the scriptures is most important is when we talk about the Bereans, because what was even Paul and the apostles being judged by when it comes to yeah. their teaching? Amen. Yeah. Acts 17, 11, you know, and I love that for the reason you brought it up. And also because Paul is, you know, the point you're making, Chad, is a, a salient, very important point, is they were submitting to uh, the Old Testament teaching uh, as to whether or not they were representatives of God or not. And in Acts 17, 11, it says the Bereans were considered more noble than those of Thessalonica. Why? Because they tested what Paul was saying as they search the scriptures daily. And I love that, guys. <laughs> they, hey, these guys only have the Old Testament and they're in the scripture daily. Okay, we have the, the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Covenant as well now, and we ought to be in the Scripture daily. They meditate on the Word. They're checking out, checking out what he said daily to see if, with, whether what he said was true or not. And I love that because Paul, he's not like, you know, hey, I got, you know. He, no, it's like, 
does the our, our teaching match up with the original article or not and that's so contrary to what's so popular today as to where there's new prophets and, and apostles that are and they're totally trumping scripture in some ways where we have clear revelation and it's just wicked but yeah so that passage is just really beautiful because it's, it reminds me of act or galatians chapter one where paul says if we when an angel from heaven comes to you, preaches another gospel than that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. Which, Chad, that goes back to the, uh, uh, back to your point with Acts 17. Because when he's saying another gospel than what we preach, he's recognizing the gospel that they're preaching when you go to 1 Corinthians 15, that he, Paul says, I declare you the gospel by which we are being saved, but if we hold fast, you know, that which has been preached to us. Uh, and he says, which was Jesus died according to the, the scriptures. scriptures. He Amen. was buried. He rose again according to the scriptures. So Paul understands that the gospel itself is rooted in the Old Testament teaching of the coming of the Messiah and the good news. And Jesus in Acts, you know, Jesus understood this is all based on the scripture. The scriptures cannot be broken, as he says. So it's all rooted in the Old Testament teaching and they, the apostles knew you were not to deviate from the left or to the right. In fact, even when Jesus was sparring and, and, and dealing with uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth, he would over and over again say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And then uh, they would, and he'd say things, you have heard it said, and he'd be quoting, the, he's, he's quoting the, you know, what the rabbis would say, yeah. you know, and as having no authority. But then he would say, but it is written, or he'd say, and I love this, he'd say, but I say unto you, now, that's even scriptural because Moses said that God would rise up one like unto himself and you shall listen to his words. And if you don't listen to his words, judgment would come and so forth. So when Jesus is referring to scripture, there's only one authority, the one who inspired the scripture, God himself. God is going to become flesh. And that, so Jesus says two things. It is written or he says, I say unto you because he's a fulfillment of what is written. I love it because even if I got it, if we even talked about church history, one of the things that's really interesting is we knew without, we can know without a doubt, certain things are automatically, because if we talk about the canon of scripture, there are also those things that are outside of canon. It's an exclusive statement. In fact, every single time an early church father quoted scripture, he was meaning anything that wasn't that was also not scripture. Doesn't mean they were yeah. perfect, but that's the reality. That's a great point. And when you think about it too, you think about the, the canon of Scripture. You think about th these men saying, this is the Word of God and these are not. As soon as they differentiated, as soon as they were something different that was already the Judeo-Christian belief that were different from the Old Testament, they knew without a doubt it was never part of the New Covenant. And remember, we talk about Acts 17. I think Acts 17 speaks a lot to us because you think about Acts 17, these guys wanted something new. And when we talk about Marcion, yeah, I was, I was hoping I would say, Chad, elaborate that with the Marcionites <laughs> yep, because that would yep. make your point. That's exactly where I'm Praise going. Praise God. And they wanted something new. And this is one of the first canons that we have is actually a heretic's canon. Marcion was somebody who said, no, Jesus is this new God. He is something new. We want to get away from this old, old He was Testament a Gnostic, God. yeah. And so what did he do with all the Old Testament scriptures? which is the standard by which we judge. Man, I'm going ahead of myself. No, here. you're doing good, though. But this is the standard by which we judge that. He said, oh, well, these Old Covenant, these Old Testament books, all the ones, you know, whether it's the law, the prophets, and the writings, all of those things, that's a different God than this Jesus. So automatically, it was not a question. You knew without a doubt that is not part of the New Testament apostolic witness of what the Scriptures are. Yeah, absolutely. So he basically said the Old Testament's gone. He got rid of a lot of Paul, you know. Yeah, that's true. Uh, he got rid of, and, and, oh yeah, the Gospels, but then he got rid of a lot, you know, Luke, he would favor to a degree. But he basically cut and pasted the scripture to make his own doctrine, which is what the cults do, you know. <laughs> no, it's true. And I think this is a great segue into uh, really digging into some of these texts, because when we talk about the, the text of scripture, the canon that we have today, I think a lot of it, and guys, I'm telling you, I've interviewed some of the guys that I think are great on this. We've done that for the Good Fight Radio Show. We, I, I've gained so much knowledge from even stuff like uh, Josh McDowell, you know, Evidence That Man's a Verdict. You find out all these manuscripts, you're like, whoa, yeah. this is crazy. You find out that if it wasn't for the Christian church, the book as we know it today would absolutely, this is not how people read. It was usually in scroll, and what we call a codex now is somewhat of a book format. 
And it, it's not like the Christians invented it, but without them, nobody was using it the way it does now. And now this is how we all have communicated. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, and some of the stuff, the manuscripts, uh, you know, reading Jesus in the Manuscripts by Dr. Craig Evans, interviewing him, talking about all the evidences, the Gospel of John. People should make stuff. use of those interviews, man. We have the top scholars on these issues being interviewed. I mean, the top, uppermost scholars on these issues, conservative evangelical Christians. And, and those, those things are just waiting for you guys to click. And just listen to a good half hour, a good hour. Yeah, good uh, hour. There's been so many beautiful interviews along those lines. I really encourage people, you guys to make use of those because they'll shore up your, 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 like Chad's getting animated, man, because they're just great interviews of a lot of truth being poured out. Not everyone's a reader. I was just talking to someone, they're like, I don't read. And hey, guess what? Even Revelation says, blessed are those who read, read here. and hear, you know? <laughs> and keep. We and keep. keep. It. <laughs> yeah, man. Those you got to do all of them. But, you know, sometimes you, people learn better by listening. So we have that accessibility. And hey, if you say, I'll pick up the book and try as I go, those are great ways to do that and learn I learn a lot that way as well and I'm telling you right now though that data that understanding realizing it because I believe all of those things when we talk about the evidences are the grace of God every single time I think Amen. about the manuscript evidence and just how weighty it is that dr. Daniel Wallace is which we have a planned interview with him too yeah. as well and and I think about this and I always the preponderance or evidence that we have for our faith for we have in these scriptures I'm always astounded it's overwhelming yeah but one of the cool things is when we go back to those things, it's awesome to have those, but it's also not our foundation for why we believe in the canon of scripture. Because I do believe when we talk about canon or scripture and understanding that this is our text, we have to come at it from more than just a historical background. We have to come at it from more than just, hey, this church said, the church said this, and this early church father said this, and get ours. And here's a moratorium text, check this out. There's a lot of good evidences in that realm, but right. Yeah, no, I think the evidences are great, but I think we need to start Absolutely. from what the scriptures teach and start. I know that sounds circular, but it's not. And I want to get to why it's not circular. Well, before, before you do that, I'll just make yeah. one quick point. Uh, Spurgeon once said, he said, you know, you don't have to defend a lion. You just let it out of its cage. And, and I like that because you're basically going to the scripture, you're letting it out of the cage. What? What? Because this is the word of God. Yeah. So when you go to the word of God and you just and it expresses itself and then you have all these evidences of the prophecy fulfilled and so forth which we will touch upon that uh, it's it's we need to start with the scripture no amen like and one said. of the things we did an entire episode about believing the word of god specifically because we can believe the word of god because guess what we have the prophetic nature of it like the fact that we can go back to the word of god and he is the one who says how am i different than all the false gods yeah he says because i can tell the end from the beginning that's right nobody else can do that we did another episode and i love this you know these are great reference points for you guys to check out well, that's and, a more recent episode too but yeah the, both of these are and one of them had to do with the fact that the demonic the fact that oh, it yeah. is the only thing this word of god that we are given is the only thing that speaks to the spiritual reality properly yeah to to what's going on it's not meeping and muttering you know it's not this nonsense we get to have the word of god tell us specifically what the demonic realm is right you can make sense of it and also the battle we have yeah most people realm. many many people i'll say have had demonic experiences they recognize mm -hmm. that there's horrific type of experiences on a malevolent level and they're they're trying to make heads or tails what is this or something really evil you know the paralysis with the sense of it a demonic entity in the room millions have gone through that uh, all these types of experiences of uh, uh, covers being pulled down a poltergeist type activity a lot of demonic type stuff and some will say well it's aliens and you know they'll go back and forth the word of god chad yeah it gives us a, it makes it really clear there is a spiritual war and that's why the name of jesus not to re you know, do that old other message, but the name of Jesus is so powerful. I think one of the things I pointed out that, that I don't know if I brought it up there, but I've been talking about it recently. And I've talked about it here and there was a couple of the UFO guys, you know, that were, you know, with, with, was it a MUFON, M-U-F-O-N. I'm not sure how you yes, pronounce that. Yes, you got it, MUFON. Yeah, MUFON guys. And I read years ago where two of these guys, and now they're out there saying, hey, this is our testimony, is they were, you know, fourth kind of, you know, uh, encounters talking to people that had been, supposedly abducted from their standpoint by alien entities you know and uh at the more they research these guys or these guys research families are saying yeah there was this common denominator but one common denominator was was kind of perplexing to them because they found those who got deliverance from these entities and didn't have reoccurring issues were those who cried out to the name of jesus Amen. Amen. And man, when I when I read that, I was like, wow, that's my own experience when I was into the occult and so forth. And I was, you know, had a band I was forming called Beyonder, 
you know, which like the door is Beyonder, what's Beyond. Later, years later, there was a uh, comic character, I think it's Marvel, Beyonder is like a really demonic, devilish, powerful character. And anyway, uh, I was wondering, well, what are these entities? Because at first it was my subconscious, then it became, I realized, wow, I'm in touch with something that's not uh, my subconscious. I realized I'm in touch with disembodied spirits of some sort, and, but they're, they're evil. Look at my lyrics, they're all evil, they're channeling me and stuff, and I'm like, whoa. So I was like, uh, then I you know, wrote a song, you know, and I won't get into all the whole thing to try to question what these things were, but I was leaning toward these things are evil. Yeah. You know, uh, I know they're evil, but these things are these the biblical evil demons. And the other thought was, are they're alien? No, they're not aliens, man. And then it's when I opened the word of God. You know, I prayed and cried out to God, and it stopped. One of my prowl spirits. I did it again, and I'm sorry, shaking that table, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I cried out to God a second time. I was wondering why these guys are smiling. I'm like, did I say something weird? <laughs> I'm pounding that table. I'm trying man. to hold it down, but thanks, uh... <laughs> brother. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, I cried out to God again. It stopped again, and it's right when I went to the scripture. That made all the sense in the world for me. And with these MUFON guys, guess what? They're like, wait a minute. You know, they don't believe in Jesus. They're like, how come these guys get deliverance when they cry out to Jesus? And these guys both became Christians. <laughs> and they found the understanding in the God-inspired word. So we we're trying to say in that program, there's so many angles by which you can prove the Bible is the word of God. That's one nobody <coughs> typically thinks about you know yeah and joe has given away a lot of the uh, documentary we'll be working on after marvel but yes that is some, <laughs> oh did i oh, some really sorry. good stuff no no no. <laughs> praise the lord yeah no i think you guys would be really excited because we're going to try to get some of the guys from mufon yeah. as well and we've interviewed some of the experts leading experts on aliens um already so i'm excited for you guys to, to hear that when we get to that yeah. after marvel but, maybe, maybe i'd have a three-day break or something <laughs> <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do the work i'm while just you're, kidding while man you're, it's uh, just been around the clock work but it's a beat all to the lord you know amen and you know i'm obviously i'm talking with uh, pastor joe schimmel and we are talking about the word of god uh, because when it comes to our faith when it comes to you know knowing as he, we've been talking about you know in the previous episode as well just about it's the only thing that speaks to the reality both physical and metaphysical it is the only it is the only book that speaks to the plight of man and makes sense of where the world is and where it's going. And those things are all awesome. And I believe when, it, when we come at this, this question of canon, this question of scripture and so forth, when we come at it from a proper perspective, a biblical one, that's when we really gain insight. It's through God's word, what he says about it, okay? If I just go to Jesus alone, and if we start, let's start from there, and then I'm gonna go to a couple texts. But Jesus alone, if I just start from there as to what the word of God is and why I can trust it, I can know without a doubt that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again on the third day. This wasn't something that took place in a private building, in a private room, in a private cave. It wasn't somebody looking at a salamander in a bucket. It wasn't somebody with a special hat. It wasn't someone with a special revelation. It was specifically in public. And I believe God did that on purpose. Amen. Obviously, special revelation is true. We're reading from it, right? Obviously, there's things that God can do, but he, I believe, did these things in public for everyone's eyes to see. In fact, when it came to the resurrection, not only did Jesus die on a walkway into Jerusalem, but when he rose from the dead, it wasn't like, hey, he appeared over here. And there's some ominous kind of appearances, but you're talking to somebody, according to the book of Acts, the first chapter, it yeah. says specifically, you're talking about 40 days, eating and drinking. Sorry, spirits don't do that, Jehovah's Witness. Evis, eating and drinking with them, I, I, I find it's for a reason. And that same Jesus who rose from the dead in public said these words in John 17, 17. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Make them holy. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word, word is, is truth. truth. Amen. So if Jesus, the risen king, judges what truth is from lie by the word of God, then guess what I'm going to do? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, just from, just from that perspective starts us, I think, at the right point. Before we get into the rest of the scripture, I think that kind of starts at the right yeah, point. Yeah, and, that, and that's important because when you understand the context of those words, right, Chad? What, when he says, thy word is truth, the New Testament canon has not yet been written. Amen. This is before he even dies on the cross. So he's referring to, at that point, uh, prophetically, obviously, he'd be speaking of what would be coming forth as his words would be written down. And, he, and his word was given. So the words he had already given, 
He's the Word made flesh. That was truth, but they hadn't written it down yet. Who knows, maybe, you know, fr things were written down to a degree uh, by, you know, some of the apostles at that point that hadn't been brought into uh, what we call Scripture, but it would be Scripture. His Word is Scripture as soon as He speaks. It, what's written down is Scripture because Scripture refers to that which is written down, but His Word is the Word, right, as soon as He speaks it. But when He says, Thy Word is truth, He's referring to the Old Testament. And when you look at His teaching, you know, I mean, from the get-go, I mean, He's, he's Quoting the word, as we mentioned earlier in uh, the show or the last show, if you've, we've broken this into two by now, right? Yeah. Is, it's interesting because uh, when he rises from the dead and they're trying to make, they're realizing he reveals who he is, you know, and he starts showing himself from the Old Testament and the hearts of his, the couple of his disciples on the road to Emmaus are burning, you yeah. know, and their eyes are open and he, he shows them himself, it says, in the Psalms and in the law, in the Psalms and in the prophets which were how the Jews had, had basically outlined the Old Testament revelation in these three ways. And he shows him himself in all these books, and he mentions the resurrection prior to that to his apostles in regard to Jonah, you know? Yeah. And he talks about Daniel, and he talks about, in, you know, uh, the abomination of desolation as spoken by the prophet Daniel, you know, the first two, Adam and Eve, Adam that Eve, the yeah. two became one flesh. And I love that Jesus takes the books that would be the most attacked, isn't that interesting? Jonah, Daniel, Genesis, yes. the foundational books. He expressly emphasizes those books because I believe, just as you were saying, Chad, it's not by accident. You know, you're right. Uh, that it's, 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 it's part of the divine plan that he would basically put his stamp of this is the word of God. Thy word is truth. So when he says thy word of truth in John 7 and 17 in his high priestly prayer right before he dies on the cross, he's basically everything he's already said about what his word is He's saying that's his word too, and that's truth, and don't doubt it, you know? So watch out for higher criticism, uh, pea-brained, you know, so-called scholars. And I'm saying pea-brained, we're all pea-brained compared to the mind of God, <laughs> amen? Yeah. And that's what we are. I mean, that would claim to have a special insight that would overthrow the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That brings me right to what I was going to say about Jesus' words, because I think that leads right into this. Because you think about John chapter 15. You've already been made clean by the words you have heard. You yeah. think when Jesus spoke quite clearly over and over again to his apostles, I remember, you know, obviously you get into John and you have Jesus, you know, saying, well, you leave me too. He says, but yeah. you have the words of eternal life. Yeah. There is no Amen. more weight you can put to someone's words than eternal life. And then we have the New Testament. You have the book of Hebrews. What does it say? Uh, you know, that God spoke in past yeah. in many kinds of many two, different yeah. ways. Sundry ways. Yeah, you know, and yeah. Have chapter one, verse two, right? Yeah, yeah I think, through the prophets. Yeah, through the prophets. But now in these last days, it's spoken through his son. Directly through yeah. his son. And we get to hear those words, those words that, as Peter told him, have, you know, they are eternal life, the words of eternal life. Amen. So when we come at this, let's make sure we come at this thing in a proper, even guys, remember, we don't want to have vain and bad philosophy. We want to have philosophy that's based on the word of God. And so when we come at this at a proper understanding from a historical perspective, from a theological perspective and a philosophical perspective, we go back to second, sorry, I'm looking at, or I'm looking at the wrong camera, Tony's telling me. When we go back to this, we come at this at 2 Timothy 3.16. And I wanna start with the verse, and then we wanna go back, because I do believe the context, and this is giving away some of the presentation I wanna give, but I do believe the context of 2 Timothy not only gives us an understanding of what scripture is, because that's what we need to talk about, and we need to accompany this with 2 Peter uh, 1. We're, we're, we'll get into that, but we need to ask the word of God what the word of God is, because it's gonna tell us quite clearly. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says this, you know what? I got to read 15. And this is what happens every time because I have, I have to. I can relate. Now, when you, when you read 2 Timothy, remember also, and, and put this into perspective as, as we get into this. 2 Timothy is a letter written by Paul, and it is, it is literally his, his last letter he's going to write right before he's about to be mm -hmm. poured out as a drink offering. Uh, Peter Chapter did the four, same yep. thing in 2 Peter. These are, you know, they're, they're living obituaries. This is their living eulogy that they're writing. Obviously, you know, you think about Paul's relationship with Timothy, you know, the, his understudy, you know, Paul's his father in the faith, like th this, this relationship. And if he was writing a letter to tell him, hey, this is what needs to happen. This is what you need to do. There's something really, really important that Timothy will have to stick to. That's right. And here, here's what he says. All right, we'll go to verse 14. All right. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood 
you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the sacred writings, the wisdom, it says all graphe, all scripture is theanustas, God breathed or inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So I want to stop right there because just from those two verses, 16 and 17, first of all, you realize that verse 15, that this word is able to save your souls. It's a, we could go to Psalm 119. Just, just read Psalm 119. If you want to know where you should have, uh, where you should place the word of God in your heart. Yeah. I mean, Psalm 119, just bam, 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 right Circle in Circle the, the word, word and law, man. You'll get tired. Word, law, <laughs> testimony, writing, over everything. Over again, man. Yeah. It's amazing. But I, I want to talk about this because it says that it's adequate, that the word of God is adequate. And I think that that should be our starting point that the word of God is adequate to do for every single good work. Everything you can do for the Lord, it's found in the word of God. You don't need psycho babble. You know, it's sufficient. And you're, I'm not going to get into the more because I want you to read it, Chad, and have it fresh when, when you read it. But what it says it does is just amazing because that's just the beginning. It's, it's sufficient. It's adequate to make us, as Chad's going to read in a minute. And it's, it, in other words, you don't need, I love 2 Peter in um, chapter 1 where he says, uh, that he gives us all things that pertain in the life and godliness, mm -hmm. that we may be partakers of the divine nature. All things that pertain in the life and godliness are from the Lord by his word and by the power of his Holy Spirit, whereby we can understand the word of God and be encouraged to become more like Christ, convicted and encouraged and, and, and so forth. It, it's just so powerful. And if Christians could gra grab a hold of this and realize, wow, man, we're sanctified. Sanctify them. Chad, you said, you quoted the part, we emphasize thy word is truth. I'm going to try to hold it with two hands or I'm going to start pounding the table. Because uh, <laughs> like, we don't usually have mics and that's going to actually help me with this little rickety table. But uh, when you look at that, you look at the passage and you realize, wow, the scripture gives us all things that pertain in life. The Holy Spirit, the scripture. Peter's talking definitely about the Holy Spirit there. That's the context and the word of God because later on he goes on to say, <laughs> which, I'm going to, which I'm not going to say much about this passage because I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to get into that, yep. is that every word was, they were moved by, by God as they spoke. You know, that God used these the, 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 those that wrote scripture and you look at that and you realize that you don't allow you know enneagrams disc and all these weird psychological things these are recent things that are in the church has been just all kinds of ridiculous things from freud and and carl jung and, and who was led by a demon called philemon and so forth that have been brought into the church in the name of helping the church and helping with sanctification but jesus when he says that word is truth he says sanctify them by the truth you know, there's an application of his word being truth is he's the one that makes us more like himself through his word and by the Holy Spirit, whom Paul says transforms us to glory to glory. And when we start to understand that, we understand that I'm supposed to become Christ-like and I have his truth. And Paul said we're to be glorified or transformed. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But in another place, Paul talks about how it's, you know, that transformation process that takes place in Ephesians and Colossians and we're transformed to his image by his word or by his truth and we become more holy because of his truth and righteousness and we're made more like his image so in other words there's truth again I like what you said at the beginning of this this little series Chad you mentioned that when the church fathers were mentioning scripture they're also recognizing by saying that so that was a great point there's things that aren't scripture and we have his word to sanctify us by his Holy Spirit and we can never get into it enough because we we'll meditate on day and night if we're doing that we're becoming more Christ-like we're fulfilling the purpose that God had for us as we have different gifts that God uses us as we minister one to another in the body of Christ and we, and we witness the lost in the world. To, so to go and say, hey, you know what? We need shape, you know, from Rick Warren. Or we need disc, you know, which is, you know, dominance and, and inducement, you know, and submission. And then the C stands for compliance. We need this philosophy. Or we need Enneagrams, which a lot of this stuff has demonic origins. We bring this in to help us become more sanctified. That's a lie. And what you're basically doing is a slap in the face of God saying his word is sufficient. And you start to rely on the words of demons because these things have been channeled through these folks, through, through different folks. Some of the things I just mentioned, which we'll get into. So when you can put the word of God up here, which the Lord says in a very interesting passage, you know, uh, it can be translated either higher than himself, but I believe it's saying as high as himself because it's his word. You know, there's nothing higher than God. But there's, it's King, in King James, it has a, he puts his word higher than himself, you know. Well, he puts his word as high as himself. So as soon as, soon as you, Jesus is the word, the logos made flesh, right? As soon as you start saying, I need something else, you're saying that God failed in some way. 
that I need this. And we're not talking about, well, you need a mechanic, you need a dentist, you know. We're not talking about, we're talking about the soul right here. We're talking about what God said is his domain and that we're supposed to watch out for and that it's, it's in his word. We're talking, I don't go to the dentist to tinker with my soul or my mechanic to tinker with my soul. We're talking about the word of God and nobody outside of, the, of scripture or that's contrary to scripture should we be submitting to. So it's not just reverencing his word, it's also recognizing that in not just belief and doctrine, but in practice, we need to rely solely on his word and his truth. You know, there's so much there uh, that you guys just heard. And, and it's, it's interesting. See, I'm so used to the camera being on my opposite side, so I'm looking <laughs> that way. But uh, it, it's so interesting. You went to Second Peter chapter 1 and everything pertaining to life and godliness that God has, has given us. And Second Peter chapter 1, I think probably if you ask me, like teaching youth group now, I'm in Tommy's here. He was there, you know, eight years ago or something. But... Uh, but, you know, I've probably taught on Second Peter more than anything, especially chapter one. And I love those verses. You did Amazing. an entire series through that. And then the backdrop, you have, you have the backdrop of God giving us everything pertaining to life and godliness and then showing us how to do that, making sure our calling and election is sure, all of that is then in verse 16, Augmented. all the way to the end, yeah. to, the, to the end there. It's so, so vital for us to get this. And it, it's really cool because I'll be teaching on it uh, this weekend. So I'll be, I'll be excited. I'm already excited about, I'm always excited about that text, but I'll, I'll do my, my reader's digest version, or I guess uh, TikTok version. We'll, we'll try to be, you know, a little more uh, up to date here. But when we talk about second Peter chapter one, starting at verse 16, when we talk about the word of God, because people, I was just debating a guy the other night, we were sitting uh, at a friend's house, their uncle's not a believer. So of course they're like, Chad, come talk to him. So we started going back and forth and I was explaining to him. Cause he was talking to Tony. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he was talking about the, the word of man and, you know, man wrote it, you know, and I'm like, well, actually, you know, this is what the Bible says about that specifically. And a second, second Peter chapter one. And here's why it's so important, because if anyone knows whether or not the Bible was written by man and so forth, there's probably the people next to Jesus who were right there for all the things that he was doing. And notice that first John chapter one just is very clear oh, yeah. what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched with our own hands. They want to make sure like, guys, we're not just getting these ideas and philosophy from the world. Eyewitnesses. This, we were eyewitnesses. Trust, trust that we know. Peter does the exact same thing. And mm -hmm. what he does, I believe is even more profound than simply saying, look, we touched and saw because he's going to equate it to something that people say happens to them still to this day. And he's going to say, what's even more sure? What do we have? Because what happens in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 16, is, is Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We need to make sure our calling and election is sure so we become blind and short-sighted, forget the purification of our past, our past sins. And then after that, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. So I think a lot of the backdrop is you can trust that God can give you all these things because he is also the one who's given us this. And I know it because we were not merely, you know, they were spectators. They actually got to see and be involved in more than spectators when it comes to specifically, he says, we didn't follow cleverly devised tales, but were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses, to amen. And they saw it, and he's specifically talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, where you have Moses and Elijah and Jesus shining like yeah. the sun in its strength. Like we are talking about a radical event that takes place there on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter literally talks about how he heard with his own ears, was right there, that God the Father spoke to him. This is my son. Listen to him. Guys, this That's is what heavy. he talks about. He says, this is the event I saw. Check it out. You can trust me because I was there for this. And it was an embarrassing encounter for Peter too. For him to recount yeah. it is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Because God had to rebuke him. Yeah, let's build some tents. <laughs> That's I, something I, you make up. Yeah. And I think there's something more going on there too. Yeah. Probably, you know, prophetically, you know, with the feast of. Yeah, exactly. And so forth. The kingdom and so forth. And, and he thought probably Jesus was coming. Man, that's for another day. But I think he probably thought. It was a picture they, of his coming though. And then it happens right attractions. after, right? Yeah. yeah preview of coming attractions. Yeah. Amen. And so we have this whole event and he says, but we have a word more sure. Now, try to get that in your head. We have a word more sure, and he says the scriptures. The scriptures, the graphe are more sure. The ones we have right here in our hand are more sure than God speaking from the clouds. Why is that important? Well, for a number of reasons, but like I said, this is the TikTok version of this teaching because later in the same exact letter, he would talk about the graphe, the scriptures, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Yeah. And guess what else he put and classified 
as more sure than God speaking from the clouds. It's more sure than sky writing, more sure than God speaking from the clouds. It says even the writings of Paul yeah. are more sure. Even those writings are more sure than hearing God speaking from the clouds. Right, and you're not going to see the words more sure in the text there, but Chad is obviously extrapolating from chapter one, yeah. where the scripture is more sure than even my experience. And he's saying, so he's saying this is rooted in God's truth, and which prophesied the coming of the Messiah. So when he calls Paul's writing the scripture, it's, it, you can make that deduction very easily. That's exactly what he's That's saying. That's in the same letter. Yeah, That's what we do later, biblically. A little bit yeah. Later. yeah, it's exactly what's going on there. And he says, which the unlearned, you know, uh, twist to their own destruction. And the word he used for twisting there is an old Greek word that had to do with making someone say something under torture by twisting their body on a rack and making them to confess something that they would not normally say, uh, makes things up just to get out of being twisted. And that's what the false teachers do with God's word. And so they, again, it comes to his word's truth, but his word can be twisted into lies. And Peter worried about being concerned about these false teachers. So when we look at the word of God, we need to say this is his word, but we also have to make sure we don't follow somebody who says this is his word, but then says, but it really means this and departs from uh, the clear meaning of scripture and brings you into these weird false things. So it, it is back to uh, kind of interesting full circle here. <laughs> yeah. Canon, you know, yeah. it's a measurement of truth. And, and this is how we measure things from, from canon, from God's word. It's the standard by which we look at everything else through the lenses of, of scripture. So it's just beautiful. But Chad, one thing I want to do, because we only have like seven minutes left or so, oh. is it was my fault. Because I mentioned Second Peter prematurely and thinking you're probably we're probably going to get into that passage, you know, and uh, I got away from Second Timothy, and I want you to go back to Second Timothy, <laughs> yes, because yes. I feel like I would be inadequate in pointing to what you last left off in that and saying it's adequate, but it says a few more things about the word there, yeah, and I'm sure you want to get into that, so let's go back there. Quite a few things, especially because we're dealing with his the nature of, of God's word, and I I wanted to point that out specifically because we talked about it being theonostos, and as I said, when it comes to the canon of Scripture and the reason why I wanted to go to Second Peter as well, and I'm glad that we did, and we talked about what Jesus' view of Scripture was. I didn't even, I, we haven't, man, we don't even have time We're to We're scratching go. the surface, We don't even have time to go to Matthew 22. Now I really know I got to be <laughs> succinct this weekend. But, uh. <laughs> but you know, what, what Jesus says, how he holds accountable, people accountable to the Word of God, uh, all of those things. But Scripture is Scripture by its own nature. And I wanted to point that out first and foremost, because you could have all these historical arguments. You could have all these church history arguments. You could have all these, you could be like Luther, who he had what was called the canon within the canon. And that's why his view of Hebrews and James, he had some weird view. By the way, go read Hebrews and try to come to the conclusion that Luther came to, that it doesn't preach that Christ, you know? I think he was worried about, say, by grace through faith, and, and there's a whole whole thing there. But his dangerous view is of that's a why he did that with James view. as well yeah yeah back and by the way if there's a book in the New Testament that a, 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 a letter <laughs> written uh, yeah. outside of the Gospels and if you're gonna take two or three books that exalt Christ Hebrews is in that two or three easy yeah it's not close Christ is better than you know Aaron Christ is better than his sacrifice Christ is to whom the angels than does it say Moses yeah. he's greater than the angels it's greater <laughs> he's he's the same yesterday and today and forever and one reason I like Hebrews is because it so exalts Jesus like no other book in its own way I think all it all of the bad philosophy and bad thought concerning the word of God is ended by understanding what God's word is by its nature because the fact is is that the second it, it, something doesn't become scripture. And the church really... This is an important point to understand this, right here. This is probably the most important point in terms of just a short answer, maybe if you deal with Catholics uh, or, or somebody, even non, non-believers, is understanding... Wait, wait, why real quick would this be concerning regarding dealing with the Catholic? Because they believe scripture almost... The way they present it almost became scripture yep. when, bro. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the Council of Trent, really. That, well, uh, this is... If it wasn't for the Catholic Church, the Bible wouldn't even be... Uh, no, people wouldn't understand. This is the Word of God because we basically made the word of, the Bible the Word of God. Yeah, well, we gave no, it to table of contents. That's wrong because... Yeah. yeah, we gave it to table of contents. They believe that at the Council of Trent, which is really a reactionary council to uh, the Reformation, and they believe that at the Council of Trent... And by the way, still to this day, in it's still part of the Catholic Church. You are anathema if you do not believe First and Second Mac- Maccabees, Esdras, yeah, and, Apocrypha, and the Apocrypha. They they cast anathema if you don't believe those are Scripture. That's also, by the way, imagine that God. Nobody knew what God's word was until the 1500s when they got it. When they finally were able to get this table of contents divinely given by the Church, right, which lends itself back to the point you were making that yes. the Word of God is by nature Scripture, right when it's written, right when is, it's written. That's so exactly go back to that right. point, bro. 
about the difference between the church being a thermostat or a thermometer. Because does the church decide, as you with a thermostat, what temperature you want to make the room? Or does it simply recognize that which the temperature is? And it's the same exact way when it comes to the Word of God. The Word of God, the second it is given, before the ink was dry on the Gospel of John, it was the Word Amen. of God. Amen. Immediately, it was automatically the Word of God. Whether someone which, recognizes yeah. it as such or not. Right, exactly. Even when Moses wrote down, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the fact is, is it didn't become created when Moses wrote that. God had already done that. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. It is simply what we do in recognizing yeah. that which is the Word of God and what has the Absolutely. stamp of Theonostos. Yeah, and that, that is such an important point because, the, you know, not getting back into what Catholic, Roman Catholicism does, and they'll be like, well, you know, a lot of the Roman Catholics recognize, it, but they almost teach as though that's when it became the Word of God, or they make it sound like that, yeah. that we would have the Word of God. No, you had the Word of God, as Chad said, before the ink was dry. It's almost like this with the scientists recognizing the, lo the laws of physics and astrophysics and so forth well guess what after uh, you know darwin uh wisdom had just kind of influenced a lot of science and then you have einstein and others believing that there's a steady state theory which einstein later admitted was his biggest mistake Slender, yeah. the idea that the universe is just eternal and never had a beginning well guess what the hubble telescope showed that the universe is expanding showed it had a beginning point showed that space time and matter did not exist at one time therefore the universe couldn't have created itself out of space, time, and matter. And somebody else had to create it. There was a cause, and that made many uh, physicists and ast you know, astronomers become creationists, by the way. Well, guess what? As soon as they recognize, wow, there was a beginning, does that all of a sudden make the beginning happen at that point? It's another illustration we use, which when you mentioned yeah. the heavens and the earth, I thought, I can't believe you said that because I was thinking of another illustration is just that. Guess what? There was always a beginning to the universe, whether you recognize it later or not. That's not when the beginning, it became accepted then, but guess what? The beginning was the beginning when the beginning happened, amen? The Word of God is the Word of God when the Word of God happened. And I'm sorry, way to end how we started, man, pounding the desk again. No, no, it's great. <laughs> yeah, we're shaking you here, hopefully, with the Word of God. And, and I, you know, it's so funny because my, my goal was to get through 2 Timothy 2. You uh, have to at least read the rest before. of it, bro. Um, yeah, yeah. And just expound on it at least a minute, bro. <laughs> okay. So, so I wanted to point this out because, as we said, this is the living eulogy of, of Paul writing to Timothy. And remember the beginning of 2 Timothy 3. Yeah. For difficult times will come. That's right. And then you hear all of these things, you know, realizing the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant. You, you guys know a lot of these texts, treacherous, you know, everything that's going last on. Last days. In the last days. And then it, it talks about the persecutions that are going to come. Makes me think of Acts 20. That's for another message. Um, the persecutions that are going to come. And then, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus who suffer persecution. So the context of talking about what the Word of God is by its nature is the perilous times that are going to come. I yep. think that's one of the most important things for us to understand because what will Timothy be told to hold on to? What are, is the thing that is going to keep him grounded? What is the thing that on Paul's dying words to his disciple, what is the very thing that he's going to have him hold on to? You know that the Word of God, as it says in 15, by the way, able to save your souls, give me yep. a break. If you don't understand what God's able Word is by nature, souls. Amen. able to save your souls, and then 16, all scripture is theonostos, proper for teaching, for proof, for correction, for the training in, of, of, in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Amen. And that makes sure, guess what? Training in righteousness. Training this trains in righteousness. us how to live a right life. And by the way, and we'll end with yeah, this, because that, in yeah. chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, <laughs> he he's, Paul says going. that the word of Christ, you know, he, Paul says there to Timothy that there's going to be affliction, but he says to them that preach the word, which he just mentioned, is all these things Chad talked about, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For time will come when they will not heed sound doctrine, but after their own lust. That's what's happening right now, Bethel and elsewhere. They'll heap themselves teachers that will tickle the ears and tell them what they want to hear. And they'll be turned away from the truth and be turned unto fables, myth, or errors. But he says, Timothy, you continue to do the word of an evangelist and endure afflictions. So as things get worse, because Chad brought the prophetic into it, I didn't know he's going there. Praise God. As things get worse, we need to hold the word of God, no matter how much it's mocked and not turn for it. Because guess what? Turn from it. Because as Jesus said, full circle now, will you two go away, Peter? Where will I go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen.